Welcome to the podcast from Eden Worship Center. Because we believe that it is God's Word that does God's work in God's people, we want you to hear the gospel preached in the gathering of believers. We want you to read it for yourself and to join us as we think together and talk together about the sermon from this past week and what's going on in our world. You can join the conversation by sending in your comments and questions to EdenWC at Hotmail.com. May God cause His Word to come alive in your heart today. All right, well, welcome. Thanks for joining our midweek podcast. Pastor Matt here. What can I say? It's me. Pastor Harold, <laughs> Justin, it's me. It, that sorts it out good for everybody who's listening to the podcast. It's me. Founding pastor of Eden Worship Center. Oh, yeah. Yes. Father to this, my eldest. That's true. That's true. He just publicly accepted me, everybody. Jason's no longer the favorite. Oh. Actually, he probably still is. Well, I don't a, know. It's okay. But anyway, I remember when you asked me, after your son Aiden was born, when he was getting his coat of many colors, but <laughs> that hasn't arrived yet. But we love you, Aiden, and all the other grandkids. Uh, that's a that's kind of a danger, I think. Uh, I, with McKay's getting ready to pop out a, a second one, like man, Maddox has been pretty awesome. That's a lot to live up to. Yeah. I, it actually reminds me. Uh, I was listening to a thing by um, Vodi Bakum, who was talking about the role of sort of love within a biblical Christian family. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how we often will uh, pull in pagan ideas of, of love and God and all those things. And that this idea that uh, love was this mystical force wielded by Cupid who would come and just sort of, uh, yeah, had, had the bow and arrow and would, yeah. would periodically shoot you. And, and it's outside of your control. And the, the thing that struck me was I've heard a lot of people who, when baby number two is coming along and they kind of worry, like, am I going to be able to love this baby in the same way that I love the first one. Mm -hmm. And it kind of has mixed in this idea of love is a random thing. It, it happens to me. Yeah, it's the feeling that you feel when you feel like you're having a feeling like you've never felt before. That's the one. That's the <laughs> one. And it, people feel like this that feeling is outside of my control, and therefore I'm not sure I'm going to be able to love this child well or... Uh, and it pull it into something as simple as like being part of a church. I'm not sure I'll be able to uh, know these people, love these people, engage with these people like I did at my previous church. Sure, sure. And man, how many times have we had uh, people come to EWC and be here for five, six, seven years, and they look back at their previous church that they were at, and maybe they were only there a short period of time, mm -hmm. but they really... They, they've bought into that whole thing that, you know, Cupid's going to gonna strike or not going to strike. I, I don't know if I'm going to connect with these people or not. Rather than love being a choice and our feelings follow our actions. Exactly. And, you know, we're in a, a culture, a society that really preys on and promotes the emotional aspect of love. Yeah. And... You know, and idolizes it. And idolizes it that you've fallen in love. The problem is if you fall in, you can fall out. Uh, yep. And the biblical understanding that forms our worldview is that love is a choice. It's not based on my feelings, per se, but my feelings come because of my choices. And I, I think back... And, and that's that's huge. Well, it is. And I think... Back to someone, something that someone in Asia said to us. He said, you Americans, your marriages start out hot and end up cold. Ours start out cold and end up hot. And in their culture, many of their marriages were arranged. And you know, it blew me away when I was with some people. And this lady said uh, to me that I went to my parents and said, you know me better than I know myself. Find me a husband. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's so countercultural to what we, we idolize here in the Western world. Right. And it, it's not necessarily saying that's the way it should be. No. But no. It, the thing we do in the Western world is we look at what we do and we say, well, this is how it should be. 
well, that's, that's part of the ugly American sis, uh, syndrome where we think we know how to do everything bigger and better than anybody else. So just, you know, move out of the way and let me do it, yeah. you know. Sometimes uh, bigger isn't always better. You know, I, I'll never forget back in the days when you were a kid and we were on the road. I got caught up in a lot of what was going on. Not just name it and claim it. That was a part of it. But I, I just knew, if you remember, we were traveling in a like a 27-foot motorhome for two and a half <laughs> years, pulling this little Chevy Vega behind it. And we had the only good Vega that I think Chevrolet ever produced. And, uh, and we pulled that behind. And I, I just knew we were going to come home. I was praying. I was claiming. I was declaring it. And... Uh, <laughs> I just knew we were going to drive home and there was going to be this beautiful Silver Eagle Trailways bus just sitting <laughs> in our driveway. And I remember the time we were having lunch with, you used to call him the holy, holy man, Lynn Mink. And Lynn Mink, uh, well, he's on television now. But Lynn Mink said something to me that was so fantastic. And I'm going through all of this and he stopped me. Because, you know, this is right at the height of when we were learning that we could, we could pray and we could ask God for things and not feel guilty about it, pray according to his word. And it went to extremes, ultimately, of name it and claim it. But he looked at me and he said, who ever told you that bigger was better? Yep. And then he started talking to me about why a bus, get a van, which we did. Really? Yeah, That's it was Lynn Mink that... I spent most of my childhood in that van. Yes, you did. <laughs> I, for, for anyone listening, uh, just to know the grace of God, this van passed the front two seats, had zero seat belts in the entire thing. Yep. And we spent thousands of miles, Jason and I did, uh, on the floor. Uh, we, we, were, we were small enough, we played entire football games on the floor of that van. I don't even know how that's possible. Oh, I don't know either. The yeah. back bench seat didn't have a seatbelt in it laid down. Oh, in no. No, it would it would lay down into a bed. And then behind that, we had built it uh, so that we could store our sound system and suitcases and everything that we needed as we were in itinerant ministry going all over the country. So, you know, how the did great... we get on that? I don't know. Man, this is quite the podcast, everybody. <laughs> oh, it's way too much fun. It's rapturous, you could say. Well, yes. <laughs> How's that for a segue <laughs> back into the sermon from Sunday? <laughs> you know, I grew up with uh, the whole rapture theory and the escapism. And, uh, you know, I prefer to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture theory. I don't think it's in the scripture, but I prefer it because, you know, it's nice. That Let's get out good. of here. It sounds good. Uh, and really where that came from, uh, Matt and I were talking about this some, that early days, um, Schofield and uh, the Geneva Bible, they well, were... so uh, early okay. days of... Uh, Study Bibles. Study Bibles, uh, yes. Geneva Bible coming out uh, just after the Reformation, being, being really popularized. Mm -hmm. uh, so Reformed theology uh, kind of working its way in. It was the first one to have uh, cross-references where you could like go and find things within it. Which was an awesome tool. Oh yeah, my goodness. I mean, utilizing like crazy helpful things like verse numbers and, and stuff like that. Well, then you fast forward a couple hundred years, and you have uh, these guys. It wasn't one guy... Um, she looked at my notes before I start. John Nelson Darby. Yeah. Uh, so he's part of this group called the Plymouth Brethren, who are they're pulling back from uh, some of the uh, state church organizations mm -hmm. and getting together and like we're sort of rejecting that. It, it was like an early version of the house church movement. Yes. Which, as every single church movement does, sooner or later we. It's like a bunch of teenagers. Like, I reject you, Mom and Dad. <laughs> like, your ways are old-fashioned. Oh, and then what they do is they just settle into their own ways. And they do the same. Every generation does yes. the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, no, this is the way you should do it. Uh, so out of that, uh, Schofield, at that, around that same time, is publishing his study Bible, one of the earliest study Bibles. And contained within yeah. that is dispensational theology, this, this idea of God working in different dispensations, uh, and he includes at, in the study notes as if it is fact, 
Mm -hmm. uh, the theory of uh, pre-tribulation rapture, yeah. it's kind of like our, our modern schools, including as fact, the theory of evolution. Yeah. And then just generations just swallowing it. And when Schofield came out with his study Bible. And you were, were you born then? Was that? <laughs> I was born at an early age, but, but not that early, but not that early. But what I was going to say, I mean, it was a tremendous blessing to people. Uh, you know, we want to be careful here not to be yeah. overly disparaging and throw stones because it was a tremendous blessing. And there are still people who are incredibly blessed by the Schofield Bible. But well, and we recommend study Bibles all the time. Absolutely. And this is just another reminder that study Bibles are tools and resources, yep. and don't confuse the notes in your study Bible with the text. Yeah. Uh, the notes can be helpful, but they are not part of the text. They are not part of the divine revelation. The, the thing that happens, and I think probably most of the time it's a subconscious thing is you're going through here and you yep. read this and then well in my bible i read well then it isn't long until it becomes the bible says yeah uh so that's that's a danger as we work with study bibles and annotated notes and those kinds of things let them be a blessing yep. but remember they are a tool they are not the text right keep them in the context uh that they are which is not scripture uh, it, but that's that's actually really tough because once we read those things, and it, it's not just study Bible notes, because uh, there's some people who they push back. They're like, all I need is uh, my Bible and the Holy Spirit, and that's that's it. And it it is wildly simplistic to think that you can shut out every voice you've ever heard, every sermon you've ever heard, every person who's ever encouraged you. But we have to always be reforming back to Scripture. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that. When I was young in ministry, because uh, I started to preach when I was 18, and I'm, <clears throat> let's see, I'm a little dyslexic. Am Older I, than that now. Am I 47 or am I 74? One of those. One of those. I was so afraid of getting into bad theology. I didn't know who to trust in terms of resources and those kinds of things. So literally for me... I used my Bible, and all we had at the time was the King James. That's what I grew up with. Uh, I still refer to the King James, but, you know, I, for me, I, we use the ESV here at the church, but personally I use the New American Standard because Chuck Swindoll used the New <laughs> American Standard. It's <laughs> kind of awesome. Yeah. So there's a story related to that that I will spare you of my <laughs> first handling of a but that it, that's actually a really important thing that you yes. just mentioned, the, the idea of uh, there's lots of resources out there, and I'm not sure which one to believe. Yeah. I, I don't know which one to stand upon. So what I did is I just had my Bible. I had a good Bible dictionary, a good set of maps, and I had a Strong's Concordance. And that was all I used because I didn't know who to trust. Coming from my background uh, theologically, I didn't know who to trust. So for me to just delve into the scriptures was an incredible blessing. Now to be able to draw from some of these other resources is a blessing too. But again, come back to what we've said before. These things are tools, but they are not the text. And it's the text that we must always go back to because that is the revelation of God. Yeah. yeah. Which that should be the question that we are constantly asking of every resource uh, outside of the Bible. We're, mm -hmm. we're grateful. We live in a resource rich time. Yeah. yeah there's probably uh, never been a time where people have had more information at their mm -hmm. fingertips. That's right. And maybe never been a time where people are dumber. <laughs> <laughs> like Google has not been well, our friend. Well, I saw this on Facebook, and so, you know, it must be true. But it's like it's like the GPS effect. Uh, back in the day when, when you were lugging us around like small child <laughs> pinballs in the back of that van, uh, there was no GPS. No. You, you had a big giant map, and you, you charted out the course, and here's what we're going to do. And now... I drove, and your mother was the navigator with the maps. I remember. <laughs> 
<laughs> and and she would read books to us while we were driving. Oh, and my yes. brother had an imaginary friend because he was crazy. Epi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to come back. I appreciated the grace Sunday morning that you extended. Uh, when we talk about the rapture and theories of the rapture, it was a great reminder Sunday that we need to constantly be extending grace to one another because very sincere people hold different opinions and convictions, I would say, yep. about this. And we need to give grace uh, to one another. And I appreciated the grace that you extended Sunday morning uh, to people who may be ardent adherers to a pre-tribulation rapture. And then even in that, you get, you know, mid-tribulation rapture, post tribulation rapture well, how the millennium fits into things yeah. what, so the important thing is is really giving grace now one thing we know the scripture is true and and you pointed to the uh, uh first thessalonians passage uh, which has been a primary basis of the rapture theory that those who are alive and remain will meet him in the in the air and so will forever be with the Lord. That's true. Yep. I loved yep. what you said. Maybe you want to say a little more about this, but I loved what you said Sunday morning that the issue is not if we're going to meet him in the air. The issue is which direction is he headed? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's we, part of like making all of scripture fit together rather than just having pet doctrines and things that we adhere to, Yeah, which is why most of the argument and there again, we want to have grace with people who uh, think differently, uh, especially on interpretive matters of eschatology. So mm -hmm. uh, what we believe about the end things, that's that's that word eschatology. Uh, but even though we want to have grace, we still want to make the argument. Exactly. And so the question is, if we're going to fit that with the rest of what we see in Scripture, if all of Revelation is actually about Christ, the conquering king, well, then we should ask the question, is Christ retreating from this world that is devolving into chaos? Or is he descending upon this world, which is all we find in Revelation yeah. again and again? Well, I, I thought Sunday morning as you were preaching also of, of uh, what Jesus says in Matthew about two will be in the field, one taken, one left. Uh, two will be sowing or one working, one taken, one left. It was always the wicked. Yeah. Who were taken out and i i thought as i began to look at the rapture thing years ago uh in all of scripture it's the wicked that are taken out why now in revelation uh in first thessalonians do we see it as the righteous being taken yeah. out and and i thought of that sunday morning as you were preaching that here is christ descending he is invading humanity. He is invading the world that he created, that he is both Lord and Christ over. And he is, as uh, Revelation 21 says, making all things new in verse 5. Yeah. yeah. Now, it was interesting. Immediately, he says, I make all things new. Write this down. Yeah. Super important. Yeah. Super important. Because we don't feel all the time uh, like the kingdom of God is expanding like, uh, man, the imminent return of Christ that he is. In fact, I would make the argument that right now uh, he is ruling and reigning on the earth yeah. and among us. Like yeah. this, and it, it's to be this ever expanding kingdom, but we don't feel like that on some Thursday mornings where it feels like the world has crashed and uh, well, especially against us. In, in a world where we have become accustomed to, to instant gratification and yeah. seeing instant results. Okay, I am old enough to remember when instant pudding came out on the market. <laughs> okay, instant potatoes. Uh, and that's our whole thing. And you've heard me over the years, Matt, say a lot about, you know, I remember in high school when McDonald's came to Elkhart, fast food, it was glorious. Well, now everything is instant, instant, instant gratification, and that's how I view life. Yeah. The problem that we have then is, is we take that and we apply that spiritually, and if we aren't seeing things happen within 15 minutes or a couple of days, then, well, we say, where's God? What's happening here? Why isn't right. this happening? And 
We're just looking at things in the moment, and that is so dangerous for us. Um, we've got to look beyond that. Yeah, and I, I, I would just into, recommend a book, just real quick here, uh, because thinking about that, the Bible. Oh, yes. hallelujah! Uh, <laughs> thinking about this idea of instant gratification, especially. Uh, the idea of God keeping his people and judging the earth thrown over against that, that emotional argument you so often hear like, well, God has to take his church out because he could never put his church in the same place where the judgment is. Mm -hmm. um, read the book by Nick Ripkin, which is a pen name. It's not his actual name. Uh, the Insanity of God. Oh, I've heard of that. I've not read it. Super good. Uh, the Insanity of God. And he basically chronicles, because of a deep loss that he experienced in his own life and family, uh, starts chronicling the experiences of believers around the world who are living in places of difficulty and persecution mm -hmm. and finds mm -hmm. that it's actually in the middle of you know, the heart of darkness, smack dab in the middle of where it's opposed to the gospel and opposed to Christians and Christians are suffering and uh, being persecuted and imprisoned and some even killed that the gospel is growing like wildfire and it, just some amazing stories. So if you're listening to this, uh, Nick Ripkin, the insanity of God, it is really encouraging mm -hmm. and it fights mm -hmm. against this idea that I think is missing in escapism, which is God is glorified uh, when his people suffer well in trusting him. Yes, and suffer before a watching world. And, and yeah. I was reminded that the subtlety that we fall into, this trap that we fall into, is that in the rapture theory, it's just another expression. It's about me, God getting me out of this. Right. And, you know, part of what I'm I've the been, main character. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Part of what we prayed this morning is that Janice and I prayed that God would just so work in and through us that we would represent him well before a watching world. Right. It's always been the blood of the martyrs that has brought revival. Uh, and if people, I, I got to thinking, how can you have revival if, you've, if you're still dead in your sins? So maybe it's it's brought evangelism, it's brought church yep. growth, it's brought missions. Well, that... revival just means you have a big white tent in your front yard. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Because we, we've made it into forms like that. Yes, we have. Rather than what we actually mean is is evangelism, where dead hearts are coming to life. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Actual reviving, where those who have been converted but have uh, sort of slipped into complacency are... Uh, reconnected with the gospel and are ignited again with exactly. passion for Christ and reaching the lost and living in ways that honor God. And and you think of uh, of suffering and martyrdom. Uh, we've got more suffering, more martyrs today yeah. for the Lord Jesus Christ than any other time in human history. Yep. You know. Uh, I grew up hearing about Fox's Book of Martyrs. I learned very quickly you didn't want to read that at night before you went to bed. Uh, but, you know, we talk about all the martyrs. But when you look at what's going on in our world today, uh, there are more who are laying down their lives yeah. for the cause of Christ. Those stories are still being told. Yes. Still and being written. out of that is coming an incredible move of God, evangelism. But here again, we and this is my opinion, we look at things from a North American perspective where it's all about me, and so we miss yeah. the bigger picture. Yeah. So anytime yeah. I'm the center of everything that God is doing in the world, I'm going to miss it, especially if I'm looking at the book of Revelation. Yeah. Now I'm going to read this thing. And it, now we're back to that thing we were talking about of being careful to read Scripture uh, as much as mm -hmm. we can, pulling off those layers of colored glasses that we've been taught to put on where I, well, I know mm -hmm. this is what's mm -hmm. happening. So I'm reading this into it. That's eisegesis. That that's reading into the text as opposed to exegesis pulling out of the text, what's actually there. And, and that's why I thought also in, in revelation 21, five, where he says, I make all things new. The next thing he says immediately, which is still part of that verse is write these words, uh, for these words are faithful and true. So he's communicating in the midst of hardship and tribulation. And we're going to see 
you yeah. mentioned this Sunday, it's the same angel who poured out one of the bowls of wrath. I thought that it, was interesting. I thought that I'd never seen that before. And I thought, man, God, why couldn't have I seen that? Why, why did you have to let my son see that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we think about the book of Revelation, and this is the mis- one of the mistakes I think people make with this book, is thinking about this dark, scary, this is why we need to escape. Yeah, this, exactly. This is why we read escape into this, mm-hmm. because it's dark and scary, and Satan's in control, and these horrible things are being poured out. We forget that right at the beginning, the center of the worship in Revelation 4 and 5 is around the throne, around the Lamb, and they're saying, who's who's worthy to open up the scroll, the, exactly. the book of the will of God, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. uh, to signal these trumpets that are blown, these bowls of wrath that are pouring out, uh, and it's... It is God, 100%, who is doing this upon the earth. Like, we don't need to escape from God. We're on his team. And it, it struck me so interesting when he's like, hey, let me show yeah. you what the church looks like. Let me, that, by church, I don't necessarily mean New Testament church. That the ecclesia, all yeah. those God have gathered. Yeah. Old Testament saints looking forward to Christ. New Testament saints exactly. looking backwards to Christ. Is, let me show you these saints. Let me show you this city. Well, And, and it's the same dude. Yeah, That's crazy. And, and I'm thinking also... Uh, from our human perspective, uh, we need to have it written down, set in stone, as it were, that the words of the Lord are faithful and true in the midst of the chaos that's going on around us. And speaking of chaos, you know, one of the things you talked about Sunday morning is the opening verse of chapter 21, where it talks about the sea being no more and the sea being almost... um, symbolic of the chaos that's going on around us in this yeah, world. Was one of the commentaries I was reading was talking about... It was a commentary, not text, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout Scripture, how it it talks about the sea, and it in those ancient times, the sea was really useful in getting places. Sure. And it was precarious. Mm-hmm. Like, even Paul's, like, shipwrecked a whole bunch of times, spent a night out in the middle of the sea, and, you know, it's... It's this useful but unpredictable. Sometimes it can crash in on you. And all of the all the chaos and unpredictableness of this world is just gone. Yeah. Well, and that, that imagery is still used somewhat today by <clears throat> those of us who are a little older and were born in the last century, uh, where we talk about the sea of life and the uncertainty as we navigate the sea of life. So I just thought that was an amazing perspective and a reminder again that our hope is not in the world in which we live yeah. or the world uh, the circumstances are going on around whether us. it's calm or chaotic what, whether exactly whether it's calm or chaotic because there's coming a day when not only every tear gets wiped away but every chaos gets wiped away oh yeah Man, can't you just long for the day when drama is gone glory to god <laughs> oh my goodness yeah <clears throat> You know, that's part of our human fallen condition that just seems to rise up, that there seems to be drama everywhere. And it comes back, I think, Matt, to in these closing chapters of Revelation, in fact, of all of Revelation, that we are reminded is that our identity is not in who we are. It's in whose we are. Yeah. Our identity is in the Lamb. Everything is focused on the Lamb the lamb worthy is the lamb and it totally takes the focus off of me and in fact i i don't remember which point it was sunday in your sermon but i I wrote a note at the bottom of my note page because i anticipated more good things were coming and i wanted to to disappoint you (laughs) but i wrote down (laughs) this my spirit is not controlled or de- defined by what's going on in my body or in the world around me. And I, that needed to be a reminder to me. Mm. His words are faithful and true. Therefore, my spirit, my joy, how I live my life is not defined by the aches and pains of my body, which are becoming more and more uh, as the years go by, or the chaos that's going on in the world around me, whether it's be world events or whether it's the chaos of people in the world around me. My spirit is defined by the fact that I'm a child of God. I'm a part of the family of God. The righteousness of God has been placed on me in Christ Jesus, not something that I've earned, 
not something that I deserve, certainly, yeah. but a gift of his sovereign, loving grace. And that's what defines me. And, you know, my prayer, I, I thought a lot about this as we were coming to this podcast today, as we were finishing up the book of Revelation, is that we would def- see ourselves based on who God says we are, based on what God says we are, and that I find my identity in him and not in the fact that, you know, I, I live where I live yeah. uh, or anything that I might do or accomplish. So when I get that part right, that right. my identity is defined in him, then my joy is not controlled. My spirit is not controlled by my bodily aches and pains at the moment or the lack thereof or if people like me. Yeah. But this that has almost universal application. It does. If we can get this idea that we are embodied spirits, that God forms Adam out of the dust of the earth, uh, breathes into him the breath of life, and mm-hmm. Adam becomes a living spirit inside a body. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that body that we have now, because sin has come into the world, will slow down, will die, will decay, but... Like our spirit doesn't die. Like we, we no. are eternal beings, at least going forward. Yes. That we had a beginning, so we're not like eternal like God, who is eternal in both directions, past and present. But going forward, we, we're this undying spirit who right now live in a body, but seeing past this body is so difficult sometimes. Yeah. And if we can catch that, man, that's encouraging for pastors who are struggling with really difficult times and maybe not seeing the results they want to. It's encouraging for parents who are struggling with difficult times Mm -hmm. and not seeing the Mm -hmm. results they want to in their family and their children. And you are clinging to the word of God, that God is uh, sovereign over this moment. Uh, God is using this, uh, the whole golden chain of salvation at the end of Romans 8, uh, that God knows us, calls us. uh, It's him who justifies. It's him who sanctifies. And in the end, it'll be him who glorifies and it, we cling to that. It, it's helpful for, I mean, so all the way pastors to maybe people struggling with uh, sexual identity issues. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not actually defined in my spirit, in who, who God has made me to be by how I feel about this body that I'm in. Exactly. We all have frustrations sure with our do. bodies. Sure we and do. yet it's the word of God that defines us. Not mm-hmm. how I feel on any given day mm-hmm. or even a whole bunch of days strung together. Yes, right. It's God's word that defines uh, good, bad, right, and wrong, who I am, male and female, all well, of those things. Uh, there's, there's two things that come to mind. Is I, One, I love what Paul says in Romans. Uh, if any man be in Christ, he is. Yeah. It's a state of being. He is a new creation. And when you think that, you know, my identity in Christ brings me to a new state of being. The other thing that is an encouragement to me is that no matter what's going on in your life, you are exactly in the place that God wants you right now. He may change that tomorrow. But as right now, to know that you are in that place doing what he's called you to do. And God wants you to trust him in the midst of that. Yeah. He's using that to reveal sin within your heart, idolatry within your heart, selfishness. And that and that's, put that to death trust in him. Yeah, that's that's really a struggle, you know, in terms of leadership. Um and I don't know if you know this, Matt, but during the sixteen years that we were on the road as a family, we were basically with churches that were out of the way that nobody wanted to go to, uh, but us. We'd go. And we probably spent more time sitting around a kitchen table with the pastor and his wife than we did with their, their congregations, just listening to them, hearing their hurts. And there's, we have so many people leaving the ministry right now. They say that with youth pastors, the average lifespan of a youth pastor in a church is six months. Mm. It's frightening. And we have so many people leaving the ministry. And, and it, I think you, pastor, senior pastors, it's like 18 months to two years, something yeah, like that. Yeah, until they move. Yeah. Well, uh, a lot of them, then they're done. Exactly. That, they, they are just burnt out. So something that you said, um, and it was a quote by Mark Dever that I thought was so good. Uh, in life, you said we must, he said we must not put our hopes in what we see 
yeah. this side of the grave. And I, I just put parenthesis in there. In life, in ministry, we must not put yeah. our hopes or our sense of worth, I put in, in parenthesis, in what we can see on this side of the grave. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and if it do, he, he says in there, if it does add up, we're probably looking at it wrong. Well, and, well, what was the, the reference from... Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, 15. I just flipped Read to that, that a second That's ago. That's awesome. Where, because he's, he's, <clears throat> he's making the argument that there is resurrection in Christ against those who said, like the Sadducees, that there was no resurrection. That's uh, why they're sad, you see. That's why they're sad, you see. <laughs> I couldn't help that. No, it, it's obligatory. All right, so <clears throat> uh, he says, 1 Corinthians 15... Uh, verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. He, he's making a logical argument mm -hmm, here. If mm -hmm. you're going to say nobody's raised from the dead, well, that includes Jesus. Yeah. And if uh, Christ has not been raised, well, oh, by the way, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Like if, if his death wasn't effective over sin, death and hell and resurrection to new life, uh, putting the exclamation on the end of that, you're still in your sin. Uh, verse 18, uh, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Every, every person of faith who's mm -hmm. gone before mm -hmm. is gone. And then he adds this great punctuation at the end. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. And that, that just came through so powerfully to me Sunday morning. And I would say if you're a pastor watching this, if you're a church worker, if you only measure your value and success by what you see happening around you. And I want you to know, one of the things your mom and I pray daily for you and your wife, Danielle, for your brother, Jason, and his wife, Andrea, is that God will show you positive fruit for your labor. But the reality is, if we don't see any positive fruit for our labors for the kingdom of God, this side of heaven that doesn't devalue yeah. our importance to the kingdom of God or the significance of what we're doing. Everything in our culture around us screams at us to measure our self-worth by success. I always knew and still know, and you know this too, you always, when you, when you get together with somebody and you meet another pastor, you always know the second question. How are you, how the church, and the next question is, how many people do you have? Because even in church culture, we define success in terms of number. One of my heroes has been the prophet Jeremiah. By today's standards, even within church circles, Jeremiah was a monumental failure. He preached for, what, 40 years? Nobody listened to him. Nobody got saved. Nobody ever repented. By today's standards, he was a miserable failure. Right, but that wasn't his job. That wasn't that, his job. That's his, the thing we have to keep in mind, too. What has God called me to do, and then I do it, and I can see with this vivid imagination that I have, Jeremiah stepping through the portals of heaven and being greeted by Jesus saying, well done, good and faithful servant, because he did what God called him to do. Mm -hmm. That made him successful in ministry. Yeah. And, and I would just say to us, uh, in a culture, in a society, in a world that measures everything, success by numbers, God still measures success in terms of faithfulness. Yeah. Numbers and accomplishment, God measures in faithfulness. Yeah. And you know what? All of those things are empty. This morning, um, your mom and I were reading our devotional. We've been going through Paul Tripp's book this year, New Morning Mercies, and, and he talked about that this morning in our devotional, that we put so much hope in relationships, earthly success, possessions, and they're all empty. The only place we find fulfillment is in Christ Jesus. And I love the image that you use Sunday um, about the Grand Canyon, because for the first time, your mom and I saw the Grand Canyon. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, we would be driving down the road and they would winsomely point like to the left. Like I did uh, just a little bit down there. There's the Grand Canyon. We can't see it. We don't have time to stop. 
Yeah, because on we were headed again. on on the road again. We were <laughs> headed to the next church. But hey, yeah, we're not like Willie. We don't. Our, our happy weed is. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, I hope you're listening to this podcast because your dad just said happy weed. <laughs> wow. Okay. This is a moment. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> when, when he came to Ship Shawana, I jokingly made the argument because uh, I had to help with the, Willie um, Nelson. The with the security. Willie Nelson, yeah. <laughs> we were outside doing, doing traffic, and I'm like, can we just walk the canines around his bus just one time? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, please, no. Okay. I brought this on myself. Grand Canyon. Sorry. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. So, you know, we were, unfortunately, allowed ourselves to be far too busy in ministry going from one place to another. And literally, five or six times, we were within 40 miles of the Grand Canyon. And it wasn't until this last October that I went to the Grand Canyon for the first time. And Man, there's a good uh, pastoral illustration in there. Keep going. We'll, we'll come back. Okay, we'll come back to that. And I, I wrote this down too. The answer is not only bigger and better than the Grand Canyon, it's God Himself. And and I believe as we Oh yeah, that was the uh, the Gosh, where was it? I don't know. You Saint, said, the the Saint Augustine quote from his book City of God. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Where yeah. he's like if these are the beauties afforded to sinful men, what does God have in store for those who love him? Yes. And then you went into the illustration of the Grand Canyon, and oh, it was so cold and miserable when we were there. But you're overwhelmed by the grandeur, the majesty, yeah. and the immense size of that. And you see the glory of God in that. But the greater thing is, God gives us himself. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just, not not some bigger, better version of your best life now. No, but that we actually get God. That that verse four there, and we will see Him face to face. Oh, and where the Scripture says, "I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine." His banner over me is love. Uh, yeah, well, what an interesting, and it's not just pastoral ministry. I think it's life in general, where we get so busy with the details. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, putting all the pieces together and, and by the way, making the pieces uh, fit just exactly like I have planned because we all end up a little OCD. Really? And just a little. Just a little. Okay. And then missing the incredible beauty that God has set right before us. And not, not just the beauty, but you also talked about the, the fact that we are in Christ and he is in us. Um, we are welcomed into his family and not just welcomed, but given a place of honor in the family. Uh, I almost brought this along this morning. I'm regretting that I didn't. Uh, some of you may know uh, some of my life story and that about two years ago we did a, a DNA test. My mother was adopted. Uh, I was born before my mother got married, so I've never known my birth family. It's, it's, it's quite an amazing story. And this past October, uh, I had the privilege of meeting face-to-face -face a half-sister that I never knew about. And that's a long story in and of itself. But one of her daughters sent me a package that when I opened it up, I just sat there and I literally uh, had tears in my eyes. You know your dad. I was an emotional mess. I wasn't prepared for all the emotions that I was going to feel. And in this little package was a two-page letter welcoming me into the family. That's what this is. Hmm. God's yeah. love letter welcoming us into the family. There was a couple of pictures. And then in this two-page handwritten letter, she said, I saw this little hand towel, and I just had to get it for you. And it says, every family has a story. Welcome to ours. And yeah, I'm thinking, cool. oh, that God welcomes us into his story and in his family. And, you know, I'm thinking in terms of we're getting ready to move into a Christmas series. And in a couple of weeks, 
uh, my assignment is to preach on joy to the world. The Lord has come. Why is that joy to the world? And, I, and I'm thinking of when you look at the lineage of Christ, the sordid lineage. All the messed up family that's Messed in there. up family. And all the nations of the earth are really brought into the lineage of Christ. And to think, okay, boy, what a story. Welcome to the family. If you're a new believer in Christ, welcome to the family. We've got quite a story. And most of us are just broken people in various stages of being healed by the grace of God. But, oh, what a glorious Lord and Savior we have who calls us friend. Yeah, isn't it amazing that God takes all of those messed up stories, uh, broken places that we've been, and somehow bends those things. Uh, I I remember hearing somebody use that that phrase and talking about that he uh, uses all things together for good for those who Who love him. Who are the called according to his purpose. According to his purpose. Yeah. And that he takes all of those broken, messed up things, and then he bends that whole situation in somehow in his outside of time, his sovereignty over all Mm -hmm. things. And those things that we thought defined us and broke us and disqualified us actually become the things that most effectively show us the grace and mercy of God. Uh, And Mm -hmm. most powerfully, Mm -hmm. as Jesus said, that the one who's been forgiven much loves much. Yes. That that's when we are moved the most when we see not only does he have a table prepared for those who love him uh, revelation 19, Mm -hmm. we have a seat there. Yeah. Well, and if I can be just a little personal, this this became so real to me on a much smaller level. I mean, there's nothing to compare to what Christ has done for us, adopting us into his family, calling us his children, and that we are heirs and joint heirs with him. But this whole journey of discovering my birth family illustrated some of this really powerfully of how yeah. God bends things. My mother, who was a child born out of wedlock, ultimately adopted twice before she ended up in the family, uh, the Iker family, that I, the man that I call my grandfather. 1947 came along, much different time in society. Yep. Uh, and I'm born, and mom's not married, and yet how that family brought me in, seeing the grace of God, everything that should have disqualified me. Do you realize in the Old Testament, I don't remember the exact reference right now, but the illegitimate child was not allowed in the sanctuary for 10 generations. And to think that God would call me into the ministry, call you, call your brother. And and you guys are third generation preachers in our family. Uh, My mom gets married to the man that I call my dad. And the miracle of God's grace is, I look more like him than my brother, who's his biological son. And my dad adopted me, gave me his name. And I thought, what a beautiful thing that is. Now, I need to check with some of my attorney friends, because it used to be that if a child was adopted, they could not be disinherited. Hmm. A biological child could be. but yeah, an adopted... I've been thinking about cutting a couple of my kids out. <laughs> Okay. Now, this is this is just a, a, a not the best illustration. And be careful not to, whenever there's an illustration, if you push it to extremes, it will ultimately break down on you. But think of this. We have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The glorious thing is the focus in Revelation is on the Lamb. We win. We've been adopted into this family. It's glorious. Yeah. It doesn't get any better than this. And, and I, I just got so excited in Revelation 22, you know, and, and I actually circled this in my Bible Sunday as you were preaching. They shall see his face. Yeah. In the Old Testament, nobody could see the face of God. But we'll see his face. Yep. And I, I almost broke into that song, we shall behold him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you mean almost? You just sang it. <laughs> face to face in all of his glory. Well, but that, that verse is really uh, telling. If we go slightly deeper than the one you said just a second ago, um, yeah. 
the spirit of adoption uh, by which we cry abba, abba father. father that personal term of endearment right but the fact that he has to define it it like that tells this whole story it, we're not talking to people who would have understood and by that we cry abba mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he's talking to people who are outside of this jewish family tradition where if you exactly. were if you were a jew you well number one you spoke aramaic you knew exactly what abba meant mm-hmm. and if you were outside of that well then the jews are this weird sect of people and uh, you have insiders and outsiders and we've now been invited not not into yes. j- some uh, ethnic group uh, like the jewish people uh, we've been invited into the true family of god and he goes by which we cry abba by the way you're not part of our family you don't even know what abba means it means father like the the fact that he gives us the definition cuz a lot of times we're like by which we cry abba Father, he's saying the same thing. It's like when you order chai tea and chai just means tea. You know, there's some Christians that don't drink that. (laughs) Just saying. That's that's true. And there's some who do (laughs) to the glory of Christ because it's delicious. Andrea basically only drinks that. (laughs) Okay, I'm sorry. I derailed this glorious illustration. But yeah, I mean, that. what a great image that those who are outside have been invited in, even if they don't know the language. Even if they don't know all the customs, it, saved by grace alone, uh, in Christ alone. Just a beautiful picture yeah. of what is coming. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how we're coming on time here, but something that, that I didn't want us to miss in, in what happens in Revelation 22 that is so glorious to me is it's not just God recovering something, but bringing something that humanity never had before. In Genesis, uh, in Revelation 22, it it begins by saying, "There's a river of water of life, cr- clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb." And on either side of the the river is the tree of life, whose leaves are for the healing of the nation. And then you get down in verse 14. It says, "Blessed are those who who wash their robes that they." may have the right to the tree of life. And I thought back, you know, when God created the Garden of Eden and he created Adam and Eve, and there were two trees in that garden, he said, you cannot eat of those. One was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve did eat of, and the other was the tree of life. And I, I, I never cease to be amazed and blessed that here in Revelation 22, there is something afforded to the people of God and to the nations, and I don't understand all of that. Um, but the, I think that's the same imagery we see a, a few times uh, in here, that this is for every nation, language, yes, tribe, tongue. All people groups. Yeah, as yeah. opposed to one like the Jewish people, like we were just talking about, mm-hmm. like they would have believed mm-hmm. we are the chosen people. Everyone else is out. Yeah. And, and to me, there's, there's something glorious here. Because in, in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, God says, we must put Adam and Eve out of the garden lest they take and eat of the tree of life and live forever. That was really an act of God's mercy because they'd eaten of the knowledge of the yeah. tree of good and evil. They were, sin had come into the world. If they would have eaten of the tree of life they would have been forever trapped in their sin and in death. So it's the mercy and grace of God that put them out of the garden until Christ could come. And now here we are in Revelation 22, without, joy, without fear, we joyously drink of the river of life. And I know it's imagery here, but humor me. Okay. Right. Well, we, in the same imagery Jesus uses in John 4 when he's with the woman at the well and he's like yes. if you knew who you were talking to, exactly. you'd ask me for living water mm-hmm. that you would never thirst again. So, I mean, what a glorious thing to me. Here we have in Revelation 22 something available to God's people that wasn't even uh allowed in the book of Genesis in in chapter 3. Yeah. It's it's glorious the redemption uh that we have and no wonder the spirit and the bride say, come and yeah. in Revelation twenty two seventeen, Come, come. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yeah. You know, but until he comes, I want to be found faithful until he comes. And I think of this uh, as your <clears throat> aging father. 
that I want to finish strong. I want to finish faithful. And I've decided, you know what? I want to be busy for the kingdom of God. And uh, you know what? If God calls me home on a Sunday morning while I'm in the, uh, in the pulpit preaching, hallelujah. For I, some reason, I thought you were going to say bathroom. I don't even know why. I don't know why. Well, the other thing I was going to say, or, <laughs> or if possible. I'm out on a baseball field umpiring baseball, because, you know, baseball, we will have it in, the hev- in heaven because it says in the beginning. Yeah, the big inning. Sorry. Bum, bum, bum. Da, 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 da. Well, so, like, great example, George Whitfield, uh, one of the most incredible evangelists uh, of the Great Awakening time, uh, late 1700s, uh, preaches in his lifetime to over 80% of Americans. Yeah. Like, absolutely amazing. Crazy. I got a ways to go. Yeah. Yeah. You better step up your game. But, you know, he's, he's old, he's frail, he's dying. He goes and preaches at this church and everybody follows him back to his house. And as he's trying to go upstairs to go to bed because he's a, he's going to die that night. And like, he's, he's feeling rough, you could say. And he's struck by the amount of people who are pressing sort of into uh, the entrance of this house and thinks, well, shoot. I mean, this is the same guy who said, "Uh, may it never be that I go, I travel more than a quarter of an hour with someone without sharing Christ and the gospel. And so he's like, well, of course I should preach. And he turns and Man, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's something like he preaches standing on these steps, looking at the people who've gathered inside the entrance of this home for like an hour and a half. Like he's just preached at this church. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong on the time, but it it was a long time. And then goes upstairs and dies. Yeah. Like I, it's what Paul says. I am already being poured out as a drink offering. Like, why am I saving anything in reserve? Uh, John Piper would say, so you can go pick up seashells. But, like, that's a life wasted. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we look at the book of Revelation that I don't think we'll ever exhaust what's in there and understanding that and preaching through that. But I was struck as we look at the, the book of Revelation, we see the glory of the Lamb. We see our identity and what motivation that is for us in the midst of the chaos that's going on in the world around us, in the midst of the United States where we are quickly becoming a post-Christian nation if we're not there already. And it looks like, hey, we're losing. The reality is our God's in total control and we're part of his family. He knows us by name. And I need to spend more time in his word than I do listening to the national news because it's his word that encourages me and reminds me that our God is God. There is no one like him. He is victorious. He is glorious. And nothing that comes into our world or into my life ever takes him by surprise. And he's never once says, whoops, I never saw that coming. Yep. So to be encouraged to know that our God is in control, not that I'm naive, not that I, I, I don't pay attention to what's going on in the world around me, but what I do focus on is who he is. And because of who he is and because of what he's done, I have this glorious position in Christ that I don't deserve, that I could never earn, and yet he has chosen me he's chosen you what more encouragement do i need it's good news amen and that's that's the good news we've been aiming at with the entire book of revelation as we've gone exactly that uh no matter what this moment looks like for you christ is king amen it it may not get sorted out in the next 10 minutes Uh, to be honest it may not get sorted out in your lifetime but Christ is king, and for all eternity, he will rule and reign. And there will be a day where you see the other side of this, where, where all the pieces fit together. Until that day, we're not going to walk by sight. We're going to walk by faith, by yes. trust in what God's word declares to be true mm-hmm. about who Jesus is, mm-hmm. uh, what, who we are, uh, what this world is all about. And exactly. That's what gives us hope for tomorrow. So, And with that... We stay faithful, stay focused on the lamb, stay faithful in what he's called you to do. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And like the old preacher said, I took a look at the back of the book. We win. You realize you're the old preacher, right? 
I am. <laughs> like I always it's say, happened. I took I've, a look at the back of the book. I've heard you we say win that for a long time, and it just occurred to me: it's you. It's you now. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, we look forward to worshiping together with you this coming Lord's Day. Uh, so 10 a.m. Our, our service, uh, Sunday school at 9 a.m. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Okay. Bless you. All right. God bless.